Today's topic is President Trump's executive order on policing, what it is, what it does, and how it can impact policing going forward. I'm Steve Serbalik, and I'm a panel attorney with ASCOPS in Arizona. Remember, this is a topic summary and not legal advice. First, in order to understand what this specific executive order does, it's important to understand what executive orders are generally. Executive orders are directives that have the force of law. They allow the president to issue orders to members of the federal government, instructing them on the administration's policy choices. Executive orders cannot, however, contradict legislation that was enacted by Congress and signed by the president. Additionally, policing is generally a matter of local concern, with the vast majority of police authority being based upon state constitutions and state laws. So the president's authority to change policing through an executive order is limited. That said, this executive order takes an incentive approach. It sets certain guidelines that the federal government will look for in local police departments that the departments would need to follow if they want federal grant money. Because grant money can be extensive, departments have a strong incentive to follow the guidelines. So now let's talk about what the executive order contains what policies and procedures the president set for local police departments who want grant money. The first topic he addresses is accreditation. The president's executive order has a strong incentive for local police departments to work towards independent accreditation, meaning that departments would need to have outside reviewers look at their policies, practices, and procedures if the department wants to receive federal funding. This is interesting as some of the independent accreditations are quite expensive, so this could create some additional costs for local departments. Next, the executive order bans certain chokeholds that are based upon impeding the suspect's airway unless the officer is faced with a deadly force scenario. I'd need to do more research on this one because I don't know of very many police departments that allow airway-based restraining techniques. Other techniques, like the carotid control technique, are circulation or blood-based restraints. They operate by temporarily restricting blood flow, not the airway, and those are not covered by the president's executive order. Next, the executive order creates an information sharing database where instances of serious officer misconduct, decertification, and civil judgments related to excessive force would be tracked and searchable on a national level. This database would include instances where an officer resigns or retires while under active investigation related to a use of force. The database would only include instances where officers were afforded due process. Finally, the executive order contains a number of other provisions that target providing additional resources for community services and best practices for community-based policing, and various other issues related to mental health, homelessness, and addiction, and seeks to enhance officer training in these areas. So to recap, the executive order encourages departments to receive outside accreditation and to participate in a national database regarding excessive force used by officers. It also seeks to enhance training and resources related to mental health, homelessness, and addiction. And while the president can't directly force local departments to follow these guidelines, Many departments will go along with the executive order so they can continue to be eligible for federal grants. If you have questions or comments about President Trump's executive order on safe policing for safe communities, leave them below. And if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe for more law enforcement lessons. Videos come out every Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Arizona time. Thanks for watching. I'm Steve Serbalik. Stay safe out there.